You're, 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 you're listening to the podcast for all of the news, notes, and breakdowns for your Ohio State Buckeyes. This is Sons of the Shoe with Nick Wilson and Spencer German. Sons of the Shoe rides again, Nick Wilson, Spencer German. How are you doing, everybody? Another loaded week in Columbus, literally loaded with talent. We're talking Julian Sand. We're talking Caleb Downs. Missed out on Caden Proctor. He's going to Iowa. But we got a full show to react to all of this. As always, we are a new podcast. So please make sure to follow the show wherever you get your podcasts. That includes Apple, Spotify, the free Odyssey app, 923thefan.com. And of course, you can also follow and comment on, on the show and follow along on 923thefan's YouTube page. But Today, big honor uh, uh, of somebody who I I love and just adore as a human being is going to be joining us, Spencer, to talk about the big news. Caleb Downs going to Columbus, Julian uh, saying going to Columbus, Bill O'Brien coming to Columbus as well to talk about all of it. We welcome on former Alabama safety, longtime NFL safety, now the SEC Network, and he looks completely different. He did this to throw us completely off. It's Roman Harper. Rome, welcome to the show, man. What's good, boss? Um, Nick, thanks uh, Thanks for having me. And, yes, I do look completely different. I, I shaved. I was like, new year, new me. Um, but not really, though. It, now <laughs> I can't grow hair. It's just like I want to do something different. It's all good. Well, I got to say. I say and they don't let me. I'll be on TV. I don't get to, like, just do something drastic like this. So. It's like my wife is like, dude, I don't even recognize you. You're like a completely different person. <laughs> I think what's funny about this is, is that my my partner, Dustin Fox on 92 Through the Fan, doesn't grow a beard or doesn't like get like a uh, doesn't change his facial hair during the season. But usually it's because he's a fresh faced baby. Now you're like, they want me looking with that salt and pepper gigantic beard, man. I gotta say it works. I'm, I'm just saying, you do, look, you do look about 15 years younger though, which I, I probably isn't hurting too bad. No, man. You know the crazy thing is, I look like how I looked in high school. This is yeah. like high school going to college, Rome. That's what I look like right now. It's hilarious because uh, my wife kind of looks the exact same, and uh, me and her right now look like we did in high school when we dated. So it's just weird, but. Uh, my kids are just like, Dad, you look so young. It's just weird. But, hey, man, it's it's me, though. It's still me. I, I believe you. I believe you. Um, So I guess I actually want to say of all three moves from uh, Alabama to Columbus, Bill O'Brien, Julian Sayan, and Caleb Downs, which one surprised you the most? Uh, none of them. I guess uh, <laughs> Bill O'Brien, if anybody, because I, I just – I didn't know if he would go back to college, and uh, and Ryan Day seems to be the OC or the the play caller already. So to see him bring in, I guess, a fresh face, and then how much power is he going to give Bill O'Brien over the offense uh, is what I would like to know with having him there because the quarterback Julian saying I I assume Ohio State recruited him, so him not going back to the West Coast, he was already familiar and well, he clearly was cool with leaving the West Coast with him being from there, going to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, having Rose Bowl practice, being with that team, being on campus, and then transferring and then picking Ohio State. So uh, that's not a surprise. And then Caleb Downs, I kind of heard that oh, it was going to happen anyway. So that's just what it was. Uh, Roman, I guess with with Downs specifically, he's a he's a hell of a player, five star recruit. Both Bama and uh, both Bama and Ohio State recruited him. Obviously, just what type of player? What does he bring to the table that Buckeyes fans should sort of know? Uh, in all honesty, he's going to be the highest drafted defensive back at Ohio State in the last whatever years. And you guys got that via Alabama. So congratulations. So maybe you guys <laughs> might be able to call yourselves DBU again, but because that's a while. Been the case. I, yeah. yeah it's not been the case. And look, I, I've been I, wondering I where that playing, title was for a while. Now. <laughs> hey, I'm telling you, it, it was a while where Ohio state was the, was the number one. I will give them credit. Trust me. I'm a DB. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to defensive back. So Ohio state had the title for a while. Alabama took it, and now it goes back to Ohio State because this kid is a young baller. Uh, he tackles well. He understands the game. He plays with a sense of enthusiasm. He knows how to tackle compressed space. Really great, uh, really good ball skills. He's a punt returner as well, so you get added value in the return game. Uh, don't let him 
don't let them house a return. Then he's only going to go up the boards even more. So uh, congratulations to them. And I only want what's best for him. Uh, the young man is a, is a great kid. Uh, his parents seem to be really good. Comes from from really good things. So, um, and the coaches were absolutely raved about him uh, from the moment that he stepped on the campus at Alabama. So, Ohio State's getting a really good player. And any, and I root for all these players. I don't care what university you go to. I, I like to see. I root for the players all the time. And so, when you see good ones, you cheer them on, and we all enjoy to watch them. So, they got a really good one there, and uh, it'll be fun. And uh, he clearly didn't want to go back to Georgia, which, as an Alabama fan. I'm happy about <laughs> it's a win-win. It's a win for you guys. Yeah, it's a win I'm, for us. I was fine. I'm like, if he's going to leave, I would love for him to go to Ohio State. That is awesome. So, um, yes, it'll be good. So when it comes to, um, you know, Ohio State fans, we also love to kind of look back and, and you know, go to the tape as it were. Is there a game that you can remember specifically if, if Ohio State fans want to see the full Caleb Downs that they should look to this last year and go back and just watch the game and watch his kids stand out or watch what he does best? I mean, just watch. I mean, you can go to the Rose Bowl. He's the best player. I mean, the last four to five games of the season, he was – I mean, Terry on Arnold is top tier, and he's a corner, so he impacts the game on less amount of plays. But that secondary of Alabama last year was why Alabama's defense had gotten so much better is because he steadily got better. Terry Aaron Arnold steadily got better. Um, Kool-Aid McKinstry got a little bit more consistent. And they just start using Malachi more smart, smarter as well. And you saw different games, even versus Georgia, who covered Brock Bowers in the slot. It wasn't a cornerback or Malachi Moore sometimes. It was Caleb Downs. So he plays good man-to-man -man coverage. He also tackles really well in space. So he's everything that you want. He's got the size, and he's just a freshman. So he's only going to get better uh, for the next couple of years while he's in college. I hope you guys paid him well. Yes, well, it's, we it's, likely did. <laughs> it's, it sounds like the money's really flowing right now. I, I actually, I, I, I will say this though: can I mean, can we just give you guys credit? Because Terrell Pryor back in the day kind of, kind of shook it all up back in the day. Him and Maurice Claret, who got caught with you know a really nice <laughs> system in his car when he was at Ohio State. Uh, it just you know they shouldn't have robbed him, but it's all good. I, I like Maurice; he's a cool cat, bro. I know a yeah. lot of these Ohio State guys. It's 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 interesting to go back to those two sort of players and see like the tipping point really of a lot of this. Um, and, and along those lines, I just want to ask more broadly about Saban's departure because I've kind of felt like the last couple, like the last week or so since the since the news came out, it it feels like there is sort of this colossal shift just in the overall culture of college football. And Ohio State seems to now be sort of jumping at the forefront of trying to embrace this almost new era. Just are you, Do you get that same sense? And, and what does his uh, retirement sort of mean for, for college football moving forward? Uh, well, Nick Saban changed college football. It was it, like when Nick got went back to Alabama, it was okay. You had four years to get your, your class and recruit guys in and, and be able to grow from within a program. And Nick, he changed the standard. The standard of winning eight, nine games in a season, no longer good enough. You get fired. You, you, if you don't beat the, the, the standard because Alabama was winning championship after championship after championship, the, the, the standard of college football and changed. I know all the power went down to the South in the S Southeastern Conference. Um, and then from there, it only grew and everybody was trying to compete and not only trying to put guys in the NFL – but also uh, winning championships. And, and now with the transfer portal, Ryan Day, he, he has to win these games. And with Jim Harbaugh probably more than likely going to the NFL, the Big Ten is back to be up for grabs. And so you anticipate Michigan taking a step back. Ryan Day has to take advantage of this because we all know Ohio State, whether you like to say the name Michigan or not, you still play them. And if you don't beat them, people get fired. It's the same thing at Alabama and Auburn. If you don't beat the rivalry, you don't get to keep your job long. I don't care what other games you win. Roman, I mentioned Bill O'Brien. He's the new offensive play caller. He's the new offensive coordinator in Columbus. You know, it's so funny because when he was hired here, people said, oh, Saban ran him off out of Alabama. And it's been interesting to kind of see how that's changed. I think the New England thing was a disaster, not the Alabama thing. I'm just curious, <laughs> like what, what, what was, how did, how did Bill fare in 
Alabama and and really his relationship with quarterbacks and the production got out of them. You know what? How how did Bill really feel fair in Tuscaloosa? You know, it, it's such a mixed bag of emotions because sometimes it's about who you follow up as well, and so and then it's also well, Nick's not allowing you to run your offense. It's Alabama's offense, so you're going to call my plays, and but. I, I wish they would have ran a little bit more downhill stuff, and do, but you also had Bryce Young, who was more familiar with shotgun. You also had a very explosive running back in Jameer Gibbs, which I wish you'd have just ran him a little bit more. How you see him doing and being a, you know, he's making running backs more popular again in the NFL right now if he continues to go on this wave that he's on right now for Detroit. So uh, you had Jamison Williams. You had, they had a lot of talent on that Alabama offense. I thought he fared well, but uh, all things credit, but it wasn't great because he also followed up Lane Kiffin that put up monster numbers and Brian, oh, Brian and didn't, they didn't win a championship. Lane Kiffin did. So that's the standard. That's what it, you're always measured up against when you're at Alabama. So if you hear the outside people, they're not going to have the best experience with him at offensive coordinator. It's because he followed up Lane Kiffin where you felt a complete change in offense from slowing it down, pat, like more run oriented to pass and winning a championship to what Bill O'Brien did which did not win a championship. Back to some of the players who have obviously transferred recently, and, and Julian Sane was the big one over the weekend, the, the five-star, uh, number three overall player last year in, in, this, in this upcoming class. Um, it, what, are the, what, is, what is Ohio State getting in him from a quarterback standpoint? We know um, they, they were recruiting him from the beginning anyway. And they have Aaron Nolan, who's committed this year as well. And all the reports are that he's going to stay and sort of try to duke it out. But is, is saying a guy – I know they brought in Will Howard with the expectation he's going to start, but is he a guy that could compete really early for the starting job or is it going to maybe take a year? You know what, Spencer? Man, dude, I'm being honest with you. Dude, I do not pay attention to high school players. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> dude, I mean, we'll all see. Good. Uh, yeah, he, he's the number one guy. So good luck with that. Um, I mean, he's there to compete. I, I appreciate that. So, hey, look, man, uh, competition brings out the best in everybody. If he's going to play, he's going to play. I, I like the thing about today's college football is that the, like, you don't have to be a, a four-year senior guy. Like, you know, the best players play, and movement happens. And because movement happens, everybody's trying to play and get on the field. So he went to where he thought he had a chance to go and play and compete. And so for that alone – I applaud him for that, and good luck to him. Uh, All I want, like I said earlier, is to cheer for these players and hopefully successful no matter what he's doing. It really has been the Alabama to Columbus pipeline because (laughs) we also got Seth McLaughlin, and I know you know he was the center for the playoff game. There was a lot of uh, things said about him because of some missed snaps. I'm just curious, how much of him leaving Alabama – do you think was owed to some of the backlash to that one game, or do you think he's just kind of uh, – do you think he's a better player than that one game would let on, do you think? So the, they had had inconsistent snaps all year long. I mean, that one was just an, an enormous amount of bad snaps in one game. So And he had his hands full. So um, uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm not him. I haven't talked to McLaughlin, so uh, – it's unfortunate it happened, but hey, man, these fans are brutal, all right? It's just what it is. When you put that jersey on and you're in the arena, you open yourself up to this lifestyle. And so I'd never apologize for fans being fans, unless when they cross over the line. But internet bullying is real. And if you get, if you are shaken or moved by the booze, then I don't want to hear you loving all everybody when you're getting the roars of the crowd. You, you take it both ways. You can't be shaken on either one of them. You can't believe all the love when they give it to you, and you can't believe the naysayers and the booers when they give it to you as well. That's part of the game. And if you're going to be a professional, you're never going to be perfect. You're going to have those things, and Twitter's going to be Twitter. At the end of the day, it, it is what it is, and he's moved on. Hopefully he has a, a better last kind of couple of years of his career, and he finishes off strong. And so that will be part of his journey and part of his story. Now, what he does with the rest of this story, because he still is a young man and has a lot of book left to write, then that would be determined. And that's up to him and how he takes this moment and goes on from it. 
you mentioned how, how brutal the fans can be. And I mean, it's not just the SEC. It's not just Bama. We see the same thing at Ohio State, obviously, too. Um, <laughs> yeah, <it's> like, yeah. <laughs> we, we get it. Um, but, but I guess – what... get rid of Ryan Day and he loses one game a year. Oh, yeah. He's I mean, got to go. <laughs> <laughs> He's gotta go. We've been we've One been game fight, year. we've been fighting those people on the YouTube comments since uh, the, the, the yeah. end of the season. So, um, I, I guess what has been the overall reaction uh, amidst Bama fans, but also just in the SEC, sort of seeing this shifting of power and seeing the the players that are entering the portal and going elsewhere. Obviously, most notably Columbus. Uh, that you know, everybody, no nobody's beyond this. Okay. Nobody is beyond this. Everybody thinks Alabama. Look, I wouldn't have said Alabama when Alabama was not the dominant force that they are. And so uh, time is delicate. Uh, coaches matter in these sense of times. And um, Nick Saban mattered. These, a lot of these kids, they go to Alabama to be coached by Nick Saban. Um, and when I went to school, I, I loved, I liked the coach, but it was still a great university. We still had 12 national championships. Now we have 18. And so – because of what Nick's not no bragging though, but we got 18. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm just telling you how much things have changed. Yeah, I'm just telling you. And so these kids don't go to Alabama just for the the lore, the legend, the 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 you know the backstories, all the championships of the past. No, they're going there right now to get the championships of today. And so that's how much time has changed and what Nick has been able to do and build. And so a lot of these kids, when Nick is no longer there, what's the staying factor? So. That's half of it. And also, you know, it's also the times we live in. Uh, but as far as everybody on the outside, I mean, Alabama fans, of course, are a little bit nervous and they haven't felt this way in a long time. And understandably so. And uh, things have never been like this because they had Nick and it's been so consistent. But then you also have fans on the outside. It's a lot of people that are happy. It's power players that are probably on campus that haven't been able to say a word about the football program because nobody's going to talk back to Nick. Nick has had the power over everything the last 12 and a half, 13 years. And so now you have people that have to get to make more decisions and they like that because power is what it is. And then you also have other teams like Auburn that are happy. I had a friend of mine said, he said, dude, this feels like, I don't know if it felt like this, but he's like, I lived through like, like when the communists, the Ber Berlin wall just fell for us, you know? Like we got a chance, <laughs> oh, like we God. are back. <laughs> like I lived through 17 years of having no chance. Like, we, we were never – like, we were always behind the eight ball. As long as Nick Saban was there, we it, they won four times in 17 years. That's not a good feeling as a rivalry game. You know that. And so you also have LSU fans. They're like, oh, man, we're, dude, we're good. George is like, Kirby's the guy. The one person that could beat Georgia is no longer there. Georgia beats everybody but one person. and Well, one team because of one person. And so all these people are back alive again. And so – it's going to look and feel a little bit differently. Alabama hired a great coach as far as record, the things he's been to accomplish. But, man, the, the actual odds of replacing the GOAT, though, are so hard. The odds are not in your favor as far as history goes and have to do this job. Rome, it's great to talk with you, man. It's good to see you, even though you look wildly different and completely threw <laughs> me off. But no, seriously, you're one of the good dudes, not just in football, but in, in the man, media. I and I appreciate you, buddy. Thank you so much. No, nah, man, thank you guys for having me, man. Uh, good luck, man. And uh, I'm, I'm a roll tie guy, but I did learn from my boys, all my teammates, Malcolm Jenkins, Teddy G, Ted Ginn, yep. uh, OH, OH, guys, OH. I know. Uh, good stuff, Rome. <laughs> Be good. Thanks, buddy. That was so cool, man. We we uh we obviously have a lot to react to that, uh, Spencer. But uh, we uh I just I really love me some Roman Harper. He was always one of the nicest guys. I I knew Roman from down in Charlotte, and just anytime you needed something, uh, Roman was just the best I, of people. He was he was great. Um, I mean, if there's some reason to have him on again at some point off season during the season, if Alabama and Ohio State cross paths in the playoff next year or something like. Sign me up. He 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 was he was he was great. It was great to get his insight on things, and, and he seems like an awesome person. So, all right, guys, we are going to react to what Rome had to say, and obviously the latest in Columbus, including Julian saying hashtag just saying. Uh, more on the Caleb Down stuff, but first a quick word from our sponsor.
Sons of the Shoe is back with just Spencer German. Unfortunately, Nick Wilson on the mend, to, uh, attending to his voice. If you if you caught it during our uh, Roman Harper interview, you could tell his voice was a little bit crackly, not his best effort. So we've given him the rest of the show to sort of take care of that, rest up a little bit, and we're hopeful he'll be back with us later in the week for, for our second episode this week. But in the meantime... I want to react to the conversation we had with Roman Harper. It was great. I, I thought he had a lot of insightful things to say just about what Ohio State's doing, the players that they're getting, particularly in, in, in Caleb Downs, and sort of what lies ahead for this team. But also, guys, I, I asked Roman the question about Nick Saban's retirement and just what it means for college football and how it really does feel like Ohio State is kind of seizing – seizing a moment here if you will and i i think that's important to understand because yeah like gone are the days where i i think a recruit can just walk into or not a recruit but a coach can walk into a recruit's living room give the pleasantries to the mom and dad and just be able to 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 recruit a player or, or lure a player in that sounds bad but convince a player to come play for you just because of who you are and what your reputation is. Like Nick Saban, I think, was kind of the the end of that era. Uh, there were so many coaches over the years that were able to just because of their their mere presence and because of who they were and because of their resume as a coach and on the field, they were able to convince players to come play for them in that way. And I think as we see, I, I don't. I, it's maybe not a mass exodus, but there's been a handful of players. Who have all entered the portal in in the new since the news broke that Nick Saban was retiring, because he was the reason that many of these players came to play for or came to play at Alabama, and so I I like he had an aura to him. Players who have have are veterans in the NFL who 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 went to Alabama and played for Nick Saban, they say the same things about him just how much of an influence he was in their decision. Guys who maybe didn't even really know a lot about Alabama, but they knew that Nick Saban was there, and they knew that if they went and played for Nick Saban, he was going to turn them into NFL prospects. He was going to turn them into players who are ready for that level, and he was going to win championships. I don't know that there's a lot of coaches, if any, left that can just walk into a kid's room and preach to them development and NFL-ready the way that Nick Saban could. I mean, obviously his resume speaks for itself. Nobody touches that. But I just think in general, like that mentality uh, to, to to the recruiting game, I think is long gone. Now, I, I on, on some level, I think Ohio State has some of that. You know, Brian Hartline is pumping out some of the best receivers in football continually year in and year out. So I, I think there's something to the fact that he can go in and he can sort of speak to players and say, hey, here's what – here's what I can do for you. Here's the, the proof is in the pudding, if you will. And I'm going to do the same. I'm going to turn you into a, this, a similarly into one of these guys that goes to the NFL and becomes a top player in, in, in this sport. Like, I think there's probably some, something to that. And I do think you've heard some players talk about this idea that Ohio state going to Ohio state or deciding to choose Ohio state as a recruit was about more than just the money there, there was a developmental part to that. And Ohio state still has that reputation. So that's good that they have that reputation, but it's not like all these guys that were at Bama just up and were like, ah, well, uh, Nick Saban's gone. I'm just going to go to Ohio state because they develop people too. We have heard a lot of the stuff. I know Lane Kiffin came out over the weekend and he dropped the, the nugget about how Ohio state spent upwards of $13 million dollars on bringing in players, whether it's through the portal or whether it's recruits that they they added in this in this this most recent class, so th there's something to the idea that yeah, the development part of it, but we all know what's driving this change in college football and the NIL era. It is financially driven and it is money first for a lot of these guys. I'm not saying that's that's the way we want it to be. I'm not saying that it should always just be about the money. I think there needs to be – you also need to go somewhere where you feel like the team has your best interests in mind. And I think largely Ohio State has proven that they're going to get you ready for the NFL if that's what you want to do. So uh, it, it's part of the equation. But the money is driving all of this. And that's why you hear things like Ohio State spending upwards of $13 million to bring people in and, um, you know, really 
actually stepping up their game with the with the NIL stuff. I also think, as Nick and I have talked about, it's a big reason why Ross Bjork is is being added to the to the athletic department as the new AD because you need a guy who's forward thinking, who can be a good fundraiser for you, who can embrace this new era, this NIL era of college football, and really be able to take it up a notch and help this program continue to navigate what is a, a sort of new time, but also do it in a way where you're staying at the top of the game. And that's why I think the Nick Saban departure is so important because I think, and other teams will, will take advantage too. I mean, Georgia now is being looked at as top dog in the SEC. No, no challenger. Roman talked about that, right? Roman flat out said that there's, there's guys at Georgia or, or everyone's looking at Georgia, like, or the, the players at Georgia, the, the Georgia org, the Georgia program is able to kind of sit there and say, well, shoot, the only team that really stood in our way every single year and the only coach that really stood in our way every single year was Alabama. Now they're out of the picture and we have a chance to really dominate this conference for years to come. So I, I like Georgia's going to try to seize the moment. I'm sure there'll be others. Oregon keeping Dan Lanning, I think was huge for them. They're trying to sort of seize on that opportunity in that moment that's now sort of presented itself. But Ohio State clearly has stepped up their game and tried to be at the forefront of this new era and tried to really take the reins here of, okay, Nick Saban's gone. We want to continue to be relevant. We want to continue to be that. They almost want – it feels to me like they are trying to – what Nick Saban was to this now gone – has been era of college football and recruiting that he now leaves and departs from and, and opens up, I think the floodgates on all this NIL stuff, it was already opened, but now with Nick Saban out of the way, like there's nothing standing in the way from all these teams embracing this fully. And I think what Nick Saban was to this previous era, I think Ohio state is trying to set the bar that they're going to be at the forefront of this next era with the NIL, with the, you know, bags of cash to kids. I, and I know that sounds bad. People don't want to hear that. People don't want to hear about high school kids being told out all this money, but it's the, it's the direction that college football has gone. It is kind of the nature of the beast here. And unfortunately, I think it's just going to have to be the way we live with it. Now, can they find ways to fix it, regulate it, all that? That remains to be seen. Maybe down the line, we get to that point. But for now, Ohio State saw an opportunity with Nick Saban retiring to get out in front of the changing tides in college football, step their game up from a financial standpoint, and start really being the almost the the trailblazers, if you will, in NIL to continue the the living up to the reputation that they have and continue to be that team. Like they want to almost, it feels like they're trying to almost be the Alabama of this new era. And I, I'm all for it. I I think what's also interesting about it is just um, like, we'll see if that continues. And obviously this is all driven largely by Michigan winning the national championship. And you've lost them threes in a row. And Ryan day on some levels kind of desperate, which by the way, I want to get to that coming up here in the, the final segment. Some were calling it desperation. So what? We'll, we'll we'll talk about that here in a little bit, um, but that that's part of the equation for sure. But I, I and we'll see if this continues beyond this year, where you're getting you know donors giving money and and really trying to fund the NIL stuff and bring in the kids that that Ohio State wants to bring in, and if it's now this collective and if if it's now got enough momentum to continue for years to come, we'll see. But at least for now, Ohio State is trying to sort of put their foot down and say. We are here to stay, and we're embracing this new time, and we're going to run with it and and and, and be this program that dominates uh, this this sort of changing of the guard, if you will. So I I, I don't know how Ohio State, how how Ohio State fans can't be excited about that, even if it means there's some decisions along the way that you don't love. Speaking of which, uh, Roman Harper talked about the Bill O'Brien hire a little bit there, and I think I understood. I think people who are throwing out like the he never won a Super Bowl, he never won a national championship in all his years in college and all his years in the NFL, and I get it. It's it's the low-hanging fruit argument against Bill O'Brien. But if 
at face value, guys, I'm having a hard time finding a lot of reasons to hate this. Like, is he personality wise, maybe a little hot? Does, does he run a little hot? I mentioned with Nick last episode, his nickname is that was the teapot with the Patriots. Cause he always kind of the smoke would be coming out of his ears. He'd like really lean it, like lay into guys at times. So I get it. Like you got to have a different temperament with, with, with high school to college recruits and kids. But I also think he did have a successful time at Penn state and he clearly was good enough for Nick Saban staff. So he must be able to sort of navigate, manage those things just fine. I'm having a hard time finding the the negatives in this. Like I, I think if you wanted a guy to come in, if if the if the if the problem was that you didn't want Ryan Day to be a play caller anymore, and you were over his offensive mindset fully, and and all this different stuff, and as Roman mentioned, a lot of that was he was coming in and running what Nick Saban wanted to run. So maybe, there's probably going to be some of that where he's going to run stuff within what Ryan Day wants to do but he's at least passing off some of that responsibility here and trusting in somebody who's seen it all. So I, I, I'm willing to give it a chance. Like most of the things that we've seen kind of play out this, this off season, including Will Howard at quarterback, which is still a question, but I do think um, anybody who's upset about that, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not on the same page as you with that because I, I think that Bill O'Brien has proven he can be a good offensive mind wherever he is. And I think this is just another sign that Ryan Day is fully embracing, like, I got to get this thing right. I got to trust in some other people. It can't all be on me. And I think that's better for the program long term. So we'll see how long Bill O'Brien's in Columbus. But at least for this year, I, I think it's a good sign for what, what they're trying to do and what Ryan Day's trying to sort of do in terms of the responsibilities he has and this, the responsibilities that he's delegating off. And as we talked about last episode, too, I don't think this has anything to do with uh, the future – of uh, Brian Hartline. I, I don't think that's impacted whatsoever by this. I'm imagining he was in the loop on it. Another thing I wanted to get to, because Roman Harper raved about Caleb Downs. And I I think the fact that you are getting a ready to a, a plug and play player at safety, he basically made it sound like he's going to be like the best player on the field for Ohio state next year. Even with think about all the guys that are coming back. Right. And especially all the guys coming back on defense. I am so excited to see him out there on the field and play for this team. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's an opportunity for Ohio state to add to an already really good defense. And um, it sounds like based on what we've seen on the tape and all that, and you can go back and watch some of those games that, that Roman mentioned, you got a guy who can do it all on special teams, do it all on defense. Like this, this guy is going to be an absolute star and for him to be playing for, Ohio State is is going to be a lot of fun, and it's just the latest in a long line of additions that I, I think are going to pay massive, massive dividends for this for this Buckeyes team next year. It it it, it ups the ante. It, we already asked the question, you know, is it championship or bust next year? I, my stance on it is you got to at least get there with this roster they've compiled, with the talent that they have coming back, with the guys they brought in now through the transfer portal. You have to. Um, you absolutely have to get to that level. Like anything other than that, I think is going to be a a disappointment. We know beating Michigan. I didn't even mention it because that's already a given. If he doesn't beat Michigan, his seat is as hot as it's ever been light lit, lit on fire. And he's sitting in the flames. Like he knows that that's why he's doing what he's doing. Ryan day I'm alluding to. And I do think beyond that, because this, this team coming back and I think it's actually an interesting question. I'd like to discuss with Nick whether or not we think that this team is better talent wise than the 2015 team not that came back and and was supposed to sort of repeat and all this after they won in 2014 i think it's a fascinating question those two rosters absolutely stacked with with returners and guys that were coming back i think the one question will sort of and, and it's the one question i think we all have is what's the quarterback position going to look like is is will howard going to be close to what JT Barrett was giving you. And I know that 2015 season, it was kind of a combo of him and Cardell Jones and that kind of blew up in their faces. But you, you know, you got, you got the running back that I think you could stack up against Zeke and his heyday. You got a defense that can stack up with the guys who returned on defense that year um, after they won a national championship. I, I think it's a fascinating question that I, I'd, I'd like to explore more for sure with Nick when he's, when he's back with me this week. I also want to explore uh, what we think about the quarterback room because, guys, Julian Sayin is a legit 
quarterback prospect. Not that Ohio State's ever not getting legit quarterback prospects, but you put him in this room now, and I know there was instant worry about what this means for Aaron Noland and whether or not he's going to leave. And and it sounds like he's sticking around. He's willing to sort of duke this out. But is there a scenario where one of these freshmen really takes the reins here and, and maybe surprises some people in spring ball and throughout? I know the in, the, the immediate reports were that Will Howard is is coming to Ohio State to be the starter. But now that you got so much competition sort of fueling them, feeling the entire group sort of fueling each other in this room. I'd be interested to see that. I mean, that spring game is going to be must watch TV for Buckeyes fans because you're going to see a lot of different quarterbacks. You're going to see a lot of, a lot of these guys getting work and we're going to get our first look at what Will Howard would look like or any of these guys would look like potentially running this offense. And we'll see if that trickles then into the summer and into the preseason. Let's hope we don't have another quarterback competition that runs into the season. Let's hope it's settled by then because I always think that's a dicey idea when you start the season like that, sort of rotating guys a la the 2015 team that, that brought back Cardale and JT Barrett and sort of rotated them at the beginning of the season. I think you got to end up picking just one. But I am fascinated by this group and what it's going to look like and who really seizes some opportunities that could be ahead of them. Let's take a break and hear a word from our sponsors. When we get back, though, guys, I understand there's some people that are upset that it took absolute desperation for the Buckeyes to get here. But frankly, I don't really care. Plus, The Michigan Panic Meter, the latest on John Harbaugh's pursuits in the NFL. All that and more coming your way on Sons of the Shoe as we wrap things up for this latest episode. Sons of the Shoe is back. Be sure to like, follow, subscribe, whatever you want to call it, uh, at uh, via the 92 to the fan YouTube page, wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, you name it, you'll find us there. And we always appreciate those likes and those uh, those subscribers, and also the comments in in YouTube. Even if it's if if it's hate bombing our our podcast, Nick and I embrace it. We'll go back and forth with you. We'll have some fun. We get a lot of that from Michigan fans. Totally fine. We also get a lot of it from Michigan fans who don't understand what this final segment is, which is always reserved first thing out of the gate for our Michigan panic meter, which is not about Michigan panicking about Ohio State. It is about Ohio State and our level of panic about Michigan. And yes, they won a national championship. Yes, that is still stuck in my craw, and I, I'm, I'm not happy about it. But given everything that's transpired, the additions that they've made, the moves that have kind of happened down in Columbus where they're just bringing in this, they're building this juggernaut team that is championship or bust mentality at this point. Um, There's a lot of pressure that comes with that, but I feel really good as we hear more and more guys going to the NFL from that Michigan team, even potentially Jim Harbaugh. Um, I I feel good about where Ohio state is at. I'm not panicked. I'm not freaking out. And I'm going to stick with where I've been, which is in the light gray. Nick is in full on dark gray, almost black. I'm in the light gray at the moment. And I think that's where I'm going to stay for at least a little bit of time here until I kind of get a better read on the Will Howard situation and what he's going to kind of look like with this team and in this offense. So we'll see how that plays out. But in the meantime, I'm staying in the the light gray. Speaking of Michigan, by the way, and I mentioned it there a little bit as sort of a sidebar, but I do think or it sounds like I should say Jim Harbaugh had a second meeting with the LA Chargers or was set to have a second meeting with the LA Chargers. And maybe things are progressing towards him actually going to the NFL. I saw a clip. Um, I, I don't, I, I think it was the, the Pat McAfee show played the clip, but I know there, it was like him speaking at a pro-life, uh, com, I don't know, conference or something. I, we don't need to get into all that, obviously. But uh, Jim Harbaugh did a quick little interview with a guy on the side, and he mentioned the phrase passing of the torch. And I know everyone was reading into what that meant. It sounded, though, like as he he, he mentioned, like getting ready for next season, he, it sounded like it was like a passing of the torch from the guys that are leaving and going pro, like one class to the next type thing. Not so much a pass of the torch for him. But I'm always here for a little a little conspiracy. I'm always here for a little reading in between the lines and interpreting things to mean more than maybe what they are. So if you want to interpret that to mean that Jim Harbaugh is for sure gone 
and he's passing the torch on to Shro more, then I am willing to embrace that, especially because it helps Ohio State. You know what? I, I mentioned last episode, there's a couple things that I think would make me go full on into the gray on my Michigan panic meter. One of them is seeing Will Howard in, in, in the spring game. Another one would probably be Jim Harbaugh going to the NFL. If that happens, I might just be hanging out in the deep end with uh, with Nick Wilson. We'll be uh, sharing the same end of the pool here. I, I I could get there with that. So we'll see if that comes to fruition. We'll see if he actually does take an NFL job and if it actually transpires that way. But that's the latest on Jim Harbaugh's NFL pursuits. I want to sort of wrap the show with a with an interesting conversation because one reaction I've – everything that has gone on with Ohio State the last couple of weeks since Michigan won the national championship, there's been sort of a mixed bag of reactions that I've kind of picked up on. I think mostly – Probably like 67% of people, 65 to 67% of people, or Ohio State fans, I should say, are absolutely ecstatically excited. They're like, finally, you're putting together this great team. You're doing the NIL stuff. You're embracing that. You're bringing in some of the best players and prospects in the country. This is what we were waiting for. Get this shit together. Get the train on the tracks. And let's go win. Let's go beat Michigan and win the national championship. I I think the majority of the reaction is that. But there is another vocal, maybe minority of the fan base that seems to believe that no matter what Ryan Day does, it's all just negative. And they'll just spite him every step of the way. It doesn't matter what he does. And so they're viewing all this as, well, what took so long? Now you're just desperate and you're doing this and you're setting yourself up for failure and it, it shouldn't have taken this to to really light the fire under your ass. And it, it, you should have already been doing this to begin with. And I understand. I understand what you're saying. Like, I, I said it a thousand times on this show alone. I'm okay going into next year not having full faith that Ryan Day should be the coach of this program long term. I am okay with that. I'm okay admitting that, saying that, whatever right now. We've established that. Line is drawn in the sand. I am with you. There's still questions about Ryan Day. I think he's trying to answer some of those questions by loading up on talent, bringing in another offensive mind in Bill O'Brien. He's got a new AD that people also don't – people have been poo-pooing Ross Bjork, and I get it. There's some things with A&M and the contract extension to Jimbo Fisher. There's Everywhere he's left, it seems like people have been happy about it. But I'm telling you guys, you can find an AD pretty much at every school – Unless it's like some legacy AD that's been there for thousands of years. I shouldn't say that. Obviously, I'm being hyperbolic. But like, I don't think Gene Smith is leaving with a lot of animosity or hatred from the fan base. But I do think that most schools, like especially in today's climate, guys are moving around all the time. There's a reason Ross Bjork has climbed the ladder to being at a program like Ohio State now. He's, he's good with money. And what do we know about this? what this, what this team and this program are doing this offseason? They're trying to raise money. They're trying to embrace the NIL stuff. Like this is all important stuff for the future of the college football landscape and the in the future of college athletics in general. So I understand the move. And yeah, I feel like you can pretty much point at something that an AD did at most schools, especially if it's one who's changed places a lot. And you'll be able to find something they did wrong that rubbed people the wrong way that now they're going to throw back, throw the mud on them, sling mud at them on their way out the door because, well, I'm glad this guy's gone. Look at this one thing he did. I think you can find that universally about a lot of about a lot of ADs and about a lot of coaches in some places too. So it's just kind of par for the course. But for that group that is sort of negative and it's it's just desperation mode for Ryan Day and like it shouldn't have taken this long. All I got to say is I don't care. I don't care what it took to get here. I'm just glad that we're here and I'm trying to enjoy the damn ride. I'm not going to sit back and every single day that Ohio State brings in a new kid in the transfer portal that I think is going to have an impact on this team. Like, what, am I supposed to be bummed out that Caleb Downs? Oh, well, if Nick Saban wouldn't have tried, he wouldn't be here. Like, you're looking for things to just punch a hole in every single thing that Ryan Day is doing that's actually a positive for the program just because you hate Ryan Day. I can't live like that. I can't think like that. I'm going to go in next season hoping that Ryan Day proves me wrong, hoping that he proves he can be the coach for this program moving forward and that he can win a national championship and that he can beat Michigan and that he is embracing some of the the changing tides in college football and that he isn't this 
dud of an offensive coach that some of us think he is. And then he's not going to curl up in a ball in the fetal position and cry to his mommy when things get tight in a game and he's got to go for it on fourth down. I hope to God he proves me wrong. That's what I want, but I'm not going to go into the season like, well, he's only doing this because he's desperate. Guys, who cares? Who cares how we got here? We're talking about Caleb Downs, one of the, the, the one of the top recruits in the nation from last year's class coming to Ohio State, the number one quarterback recruit in this year's class, 2024 class, coming to Ohio State now, along with Air Nolan, who's also sticking around, it sounds like. And then there's more. The list goes on and on and on of the guys that they've now brought in. Quinshawn Judkins. They, they just keep adding talent everywhere, adding uh, ideas and perspectives and coaches and minds. I'm not going to sit here and live in my fears and live in my hate for Ryan Day, which I don't even hate Ryan Day. I, 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 I'm i just questionable of his long-term status with the program. But again, he can prove a lot of people wrong based on how this next year goes. He's going to have to. He's got to beat Michigan, as we've established. And now that this roster is so stacked, he almost is putting more pressure on himself to deliver that ultimate end goal on top of the Michigan win which is going to win a national championship. If he pulls both those things off, we're going to have to embrace the fact that Ryan Day did it. Like, I hope people are ready for that because right now it just seems like people are ready to poo-poo everything he does at every turn. And I'm just not living in that in that world, man. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm fine questioning Ryan Day and having doubts. But this has been – like the amount of news. I mean, Nick and I, every time we get ready for this show, seems like another big nugget drops of, oh, well, Ohio State got this guy, or Ohio State got that guy, or Ohio State brought a new offensive coordinator. And we have, we've had so much stuff to talk about. It's been great for the show. It's been great to interact with you guys about it. And it's just been great in terms of the direction that the program's going. I, I had, I understand maybe not everything works out the way that we think it is. And we can, but I, I refuse to live in a world where I don't get excited about this type of stuff. I, I'm thrilled. I love what they're doing. I hope it does all pan out. Yes, there's some added pressure for Ryan Day now because he's got such a stacked roster. If he comes up short this time, it's going to be squarely on him. And then we can have those conversations. He's likely going to be getting the boot if that happens. But for now, can we just enjoy it no matter how we got here? And that's still understanding. Uh, listen, I, I, I'm not – I was very staunchly against the idea that a Michigan championship win was a good thing for Ohio State because, again, they took everything you had. You were that team. You were the team competing for national championships. Now they stole that identity from you. So I, I didn't like that. I didn't want to see it. Them getting to the championship should have been enough. Them winning it obviously put things over the top. And But I think that Ohio State was planning on doing a lot of this stuff regardless because they saw what Michigan did and they now got to the championship. They got over that hump themselves. And now you need to punch back. So, however, whatever it took to get here, I could have done without the the Michigan winning it all. But whatever it took to get here, to get here, excuse me, I'm not going to sit here and complain about it because my team, the Ohio State Buckeyes, look like they are ready to beat anybody in college football next year. And now they just got to show up and actually get it done. We'll see, we'll see. But I'm I'm very excited about spring ball. I'm very excited about next fall. And there's a lot that has to happen before that. But, uh, yeah, I, I can't not be anything but excited. All right, that's going to do it for the another episode of Sons of the Shoe. Be sure, once again, to follow, like, subscribe, all those good things, whether it be at the 92 to the Fan YouTube page, uh, where you can also comment, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the Odyssey app, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We appreciate your listenership. We appreciate appreciate your support, and we will be back later in the week with another episode. Hopefully Nick's voice, he mends it up, and it's good to go, and we're off and running on Friday with a, a fresh episode with some fresh perspectives on all things Ohio State with the latest episode of Sons of the Shoe. Until next time, take care, and go Bucks.